Okay, uh, thank you, Leif. Um, so I see we are running a little bit late. I will try to do everything I prepared, but um, if not, please just let me know when I have to, to close up everything, okay? Um, so just recalling the setting, uh, which Augusto already mentioned. So we are concerned with environments um, given by this eta here. So it takes a position and a time and returns a uh, something on uh, state space S. And uh, in Augusto's talk, it was either this uh, particle or non-particle here, bullet or circle. But uh, you can think on more generality here. And uh, for me, of course, this, this, uh, space is always going to be discrete. Time can be either discrete or continuous. And uh, we are only going to work in dimension one here. And uh, uh, we are going to assume that this environment is invariant under space-time shifts. For the random walk, um, we are only considering nearest neighbors, discrete time. Uh, it could be also continuous, but uh, here, just to keep it simpler, I'll think of discrete time. And jumps are going to be decided locally according to ETA. So I will I just stole the picture from Augusto from the first talk. So in this case here, the environment can take values either particle or non-particle, and you decide to jump left or right depending uh, with probability that depends on whether you're sitting on top of particle, on top of holes. And the um, uh, environment refreshes uh, in the next time, then you, uh, toss your coin again. So it's very simple to see that you can just couple trajectories of this random walk from different starting positions. So, um, um, so let's uh, here I, I will take a space time point like uh, X S here that I call Y and uh, this uh, big Y. Uh, Yt uh, is just the space-time position of the walk. So by uh, big X, I will just uh, uh, refer to the space position. And since it started at time S, at time T, it's going to be at position uh, T plus S. And uh, then uh, this, the jumps are just decided by a local function that looks at the um, environment in the current position. And the, some, for instance, some uniform random variable or cost, uh, a toss of a coin just to uh, decide where to, to jump. And uh, this function g that you're seeing here only returns plus one or minus one, meaning that you're jumping to the left or to the right, okay? So uh, one important feature of this is uh, some sort of monotonicity. If you start your random walk from like two points in space at the same time, but one to the left of the other, let's say with the same parity, then they, uh, this relative position of the two walks are kept for all the times. And this is going to be important for me later on. So uh, uh, is there any doubt? Uh, uh, graphical construction and monotonicity is quite simple. It's just um, the ordinary thing to do. So uh, this is all the notation. Then when I want to uh, refer to space-time position, I will just use Y and the uh, space position X, okay? So uh, let me recall the hypothesis that we are gonna use in this first, uh, the beginning of the talk. It's a decoupling uh, hypothesis. Augusto explained uh, for quite a while. Uh, so we have a time and space and boxes of side length n by 3n separated by a distance of at least n. And uh, we assume that the covariance decays as a power law with a given exponent. Uh, in Augusto's talk, it was 8 plus epsilon. Uh, it's because we need this 
how far it should be big enough for our arguments to work. And I'll try to hint why we need this. So our result is um, this one. So assume that previous vertical decoupling with alpha greater than eight, then uh, there exists some number v such that uh, x t over t converges to v almost surely. So a few remarks about this um, result. Augusto already mentioned, but uh, let me um, just recall. Uh, we are requiring a kind of fast mixing, but not uniform as previous uh, other conditions that were considered in the literature. And um, uh, what, perhaps what's nicer from our results, it's not very model dependent. So basically you only need to check that the decoupling condition is verified to have access to this result. And uh, it applies to several examples of environments, as Augusto explained, the contact process is model, uh, interacting particle system with a positive gap. And um, uh, furthermore, it's general with respect to ellipticity. So for those who have tried to work um, with random walks on random environments, the hypothesis of ellipticity, uniform ellipticity, uh, sometimes it's very important in order to control the environment as seen by the particle, but we don't use anything of this. Uh, we really only use renormalization as Augusto explained. So uh, I'm not really checking the chat. So if uh, there is any uh, doubt uh, about the statement of the result, but maybe someone can stop me. Uh, if not, I will we'll continue. And um, now my next goal is to give a proof of this theorem. And uh, I'll be cheating a little bit because I will consider IID environments. And then Augusto explained, if you were considering IID environments, then you only have simple random walks. Yeah, uh, so of course you have a uh, simple proof for uh, law of large numbers and you can also calculate uh, the, the speed, but uh, let me do it in a way that it's going to be always clear what you need in order to consider the more general hypothesis. Okay, so I'll go through this case where the environment refreshes at every time and it's always a, uh, a product of IID Bernoulli with pro uh, pr probability of uh, being a particle equal to rho. So sometimes I will call this rho the density of the environment. Okay, so uh, as Augusto mentioned, in order to carry on the, the renormalization uh, procedure, we are gonna have to choose some events to cascade. So this is what I call here the bad event. So I will look to a box, tree H by H, like these ones that appear in the decoupling hypothesis. And um, I will look for a certain reference slope or reference speed. And uh, so this, uh, if you go to, uh, if you move it uh, with speed V, then you go through this straight line here in the, picture, but if you, uh, so imagine that, so the, the bad event here is that there is one point Y in this interval in the middle of the box in the bottom, uh, such that if you start your random walk there using the graphical construction, then you're gonna finish on the right of this uh, line with slope V, okay? So this is the bad event, it's deviation above some speed v. And um, what I want, so here is just the notation, like in Augusto's talk, I will call it A. Uh, when I want to change this reference point zero that you're seeing here to another space time point w, I'll just mark it down in the event A. And uh, by translation invariance, I can just define pH of v as being the probability of this deviation event 
and regardless of the starting point or uh, the reference point zero or w or whatever so um I wish to show that this type of event cascades, like uh, the events that Augusto considered in the first talk. Uh, but first, uh, also sometimes I, uh, I will look for deviations to the left of um, of uh, some slope as well. And just for notation, uh, so when I am looking for deviations to the left of a given slope, I'll put this tilde on the top of the event and also on the top of the probabilities here. So this quantity here is the probability. Uh, this P to the VH is just the probability to deviate to the left of a given slope uh, of uh, V here. So uh, I, I want to show that this type of event cascades somehow, but then in order to do that, what I will do is to fix some scales like Augusto did. In Augusto's talk, it was three halves, the exponent uh, LK plus one was LK to the three halves. Uh, for me here, it's gonna be more convenient to work with five fourths. Um, anyway, uh, this is flexible and could, could be whatever. Uh, given that it's smaller than two for me here. So anything in between one and two would work fine here. So um, it's not true that if you go faster than V in a scale K plus, uh, K plus one, then you are gonna be go faster than V in two boxes of the previous scale. Maybe it's only one box that you hurry it up and then it already account for the deviation to the right. So in order to make this event cascade, I will need to pick one speed. Uh, it's slightly different from the other when I change scales. So here below, I have uh, initial speed and the uh, and final speed and the uh, speeds in between. And I will not enter in the details on how uh, we choose this uh, speeds VK for each scale here, but you can think if you deviated VK plus one, which is bigger than VK in the uh, box of a uh, scale K plus one, then it's, um, it's not hard to believe that you are gonna have to deviate in more than one box a little bit less, which is VK in the previous scale. So this way you can uh, have two different boxes of uh, previous scale where you see this event, uh, the similar event occurring. So you have this cascading property. Um, you can actually ask for a bunch of boxes of the previous scale as uh, where uh, the deviation event happened, so that you can assume that these boxes are separated in time by a distance bigger than LK. And here in the case that the environment is just IID, this is not important, but I just want to hint that if these boxes are separated in, in time as well, then you're gonna be able to apply the decoupling inequality. That's our main hypothesis. So um, using the cascading property, just like Augusto did, what you get is that the pro, uh, here in the left of this equation is the probability of having deviation in scale k plus one. Uh, this is smaller than the number of ways that you can pick two boxes of uh, scale k inside this big box of scale k plus one. So this is an entropy factor times uh, the probability of seeing uh, the deviation events inside this two little box of scale K. Okay? And uh, uh, here, since I assume that my environment is IID, uh, this decouples very well. So that's why I have this PK squared and no extra covariance term here. And uh, then just by my choice of the progression of the scales LK, 
I chosen LK plus one to be LK to the five fourths. So LK plus one divided by LK is LK to one fourth, uh, but it's raised to the power four. So we have this uh, LK here on the right side. Okay, so here what we do is that we try to guess one nice rate of decay for these probabilities PK, plug inside, and get this equation, uh, this equation below here. So it implies that also PK plus one has to satisfy something C times LK to the minus one power that has two minus five fourths beta minus one to the, um, sorry, uh, there's a typo here, uh, should be LK uh, to the minus beta, Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's right. Um, uh, so um, I, have, I have this first factor of LK to uh, something that it's positive if beta is high, and then LK plus one to the minus beta. So if I choose K big enough, like sufficiently, sufficiently large, uh, then I can assure that this term LK to the minus two minus five fourths beta minus one is smaller than, um, it's very small, it's smaller than one over this constant C appearing here. And then um, I will have the induction step below. So I can really propagate the bound of LK to the minus beta to the next scale, LK plus one to the minus beta. And uh, this is just, similar to what Augusto just did for percolation. So, uh, of course, now we have to trigger. So we have this initial scale K, uh, K0 where we have to show that this inequality holds. Then we are gonna have that this inequality holds for all scales from this point on. And um, in order to do that, uh, we have now this fixed size LK, uh, LK0, so it's a finite size of criterion. And one idea could be, okay, let's only look for V large enough, but then we are gonna, only gonna have decays of this deviation event for a speed that it's large. And uh, this is not convenient for us here. Another type of things that we can do is to try to drive one of the parameters of the model to an extreme value. So for instance, in this case here, but this is very particular to this case of an IID environment with some certain density, um, I can try to change the density. And uh, if, if my recursive inequalities before are all uniformly in the density, yeah, so there's a question in the chat that maybe it's, a, it's an interesting yeah. one. I'm going to repeat it. Sure. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah. Hey, Gabo. Uh, the bad event on scale LK plus one usually implies not just two bad events on scale LK, but many. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really useful because then you can have a box that are separated in time and then use the decoupling. And, um, uh, also in percolation, if you have some covariance and you can have several bots, then maybe two of them are, lar uh, are far away and then you can decouple them well. So maybe if I go back uh, a few slides here. Yeah, so if you have several, several boxes like uh, where of the previous scale where the bad event happened, then two of them are well separated and then you can uh, make it hard. okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I I think yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if you it, actually take um, L K plus boxes. one to be L K to the ten, you're gonna need many boxes. Yeah. Because then this algebra only works that way. 
is one possible application of having a bunch of boxes in the previous case. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks, Augusto. Yeah. So, if actually you 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 need an exponent bigger than two, maybe you you you, you can increase this exponent uh, here in the in this first formula uh, uh, in this formula here uh, by considering many box instead of instead of having power two here you're gonna have power the amount of boxes that you're looking at yeah uh, so I was talking about the trigger and um, then one of the ideas could be for instance to drive one of these parameters for instance the density to a very high value and then prove the that you have the uh, inequality in that fixed scale but then your result would be also perturbative in that uh, parameter so as uh, in the first part of the talk we have a way out of this so like similar to this p plus and p minus that augusto defined uh, here I will define the v minus and the v plus these are just uh, speeds that so above v plus I know that the probability is already decaying somehow at least along a subsequence it's going to zero and uh, uh, below v minus I also know that the probability is decaying along a subsequence so it's the so V plus is the minimum slope such that going faster than it is getting hard. And V minus is the biggest slope such that going slower than it is getting hard. Okay, uh, this is always well defined. So these are two quantities. And why are they important? Because they allow us to trigger the inequality uh, so let's see how we use this. We assume that we have a V bigger than V plus. We just define our sequence of speeds to each scale in this way here. Then we scale with the little h, just like Augusto did. And we get this recursive inequality here. But now, since we are always above V plus, we know that making this little h big, uh, the, the, this value uh, phlk0 has to go to zero. So we choose a constant c1 big enough so that the inequality holds at this scale k0. And then as a conclusion, we know that we have the inequality with, uh, for all k bigger than k0. K zero. Uh, then uh, this is the whole idea. We trigger by just driving this scaling parameter h here to a big value and use the fact that we are always above v plus. So if we look to bigger and bigger boxes, then the probability to go faster than any of these speeds has to go to zero. Okay, uh, any doubts about this uh, triggering procedure here? So if not, uh, I will pass through what we conclude. So in the previous sli slide, um, I had the decay only along a specific subsequence that we have chosen. Nevertheless, we can interpolate this and have a decay uh, for all uh, h like this. So now we're not only restricted to the scales. And um, now, if this exponent beta is large and we have these two inequalities here, then we know that going faster than v plus is getting very hard and going is slower than v minus is getting very hard. So somehow you have to be in between. What we want to show is that this regime is very strange. It cannot happen. So this is what Augusto called sharpness, inspired by percolation. Uh, 
And if we ever prove this sharpness, then we get law of large numbers because then we have, we just plug uh, V plus V minus equal to V in this two equation uh, inequalities here. And you have, okay, this specific value of V is important because it's hard to go faster than it and it's hard to go slower than it. And so then you have to go exactly at speed V. Okay, uh, so here is one rough idea of how you get sharpness. So let's assume that we have this fictitious regime where the V plus is bigger than V minus and try to drive a, derive a contradiction from here. So by the definition of V plus, since it's the first, the smallest value such that you have to go, uh, such that is hard to go, uh, faster than, than V plus, than it, then um, you have to actually to get speeds close to V plus, but smaller than it. Same thing for V minus. You have to get speeds uh, close to V minus, but a little bit above, just by definition, because it's the first value such that it's becoming hard to go slower than it. But being close to V minus, so here in this picture, I represented some points where if you start there, you go with speed close to V minus. Then just by monotonicity of the graphical construction, every time you pass to the left of one point like this, where you go with speed close to V minus, then it gonna, it's gonna introduce a delay in your trajectory with respect to V plus. So if you want to get now close to V plus again, you have to overcome this delay, but the only way is run faster than V plus. But we have just shown that it's hard to go faster than V plus. So you're not gonna be able to recover from these delays, okay? So this is a really rough idea on how to do the stuff. The difficulty here is that this, traps, these points where you go to speed close to V minus, they can be really, really rare. So the density can be really small. And also you don't have much information about the trajectory of the random walk yet. So it could, for instance, always try to do something mean and deviate from it and uh, just pass around and go somehow if their density is very small. So, um, in order to quantify this, we really uh, can define a value delta, which is just uh, this difference of V plus minus V minus divided by four. And uh, since we are assuming by contradiction that V plus is it's strictly bigger than V minus, then this is positive quantity. Then by definition, uh, then we define a trap as being, so we say that a point in space time is trapped like this W here. If there is a point to the right of it, but not very far, such that starting there, you are gonna go to a slope, not smaller than V uh, minus, but smaller than V minus plus this delta. And this is, this probability of this does don't decay because uh, V minus is the first value where this should decay. And you are looking a little bit above V minus, okay? And what's the point in this definition is that it really introduces delays for all points in this other interval in between uh, W and uh, this interval, uh, this uh, field interval. And so if you're starting this dotted interval here, you have to get some delay from the fact that there was a trajectory on your right that was slow somehow and uh, as i told then this traps introduce delay to recover you should run faster than v plus what's the difficulty here is that this traps only occur with a positive density that in principle could be really 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 small this is the content of this lemma here so it's not guaranteed that you're gonna be able to uh, account for all these delays. So what we do is that indeed we replace these traps for a more, a less efficient type of, of trap 
So it's going to be another kind of trap that it's somehow less efficient, but it's, it occurs with uh, much higher density. So you try to walk with a detector in your hand, like an antenna. And um, so I say that this point here below Y is threatened if its antenna can detect some trap uh, along the direction given by V plus. So I just split this long interval into smaller intervals of length H and look for R intervals of this and look for one trap in one of these, uh, in the beginning of in the bottom part of one of these R intervals here in my antenna. And uh, if there is one such trap, then I say that the point below Y is threatened. Okay, so what's the point in defining this kind of threatened points? First of all, if I make R very large, then I have several attempts of trying to find one of these traps on the right. And uh, they will already account for some delay unless I can run fast and pass to the right of this, uh, is this trap that you're seeing in the middle of the picture here. So there are two possibilities once you see uh, one, one, once you are threatened. Either you really go faster than V plus, which is hard, so you pass on the right of the trap, the small trap here, or you're gonna get delayed to the bottom, uh, to the top of the of your trajectory here at time R H. Okay. And um, now, in order for this point Y not to be threatened, none of these horizontal uh, lines here can have a trap on its right. Then since the environment is IID, you have independent tries to find this, um, these traps on your right. This should decay very fast, the probability uh, of not being threatened in R. So this is the content of this lemma. Uh, uh, not this, this one. So the, the first lemma is just that, uh, it's just say that if you are threatened, then either you run faster than V plus or you're gonna get delayed. The second one really shows that the density of this threatened point is very high because the probability of not, uh, not being threatened decays very fast in R. And what's important here is that uniformly in the uh, size of the, of the small intervals h there. So how we conclude from here? We conclude from here taking r large so that the any trajectory is going to be threatened most of the time. And since it's threatened most of the time, it cannot avoid delays because it, it cannot run faster than v plus uh, often. This generates a contradiction in the definition of v plus because if, if you get delayed with respect to V plus, then V plus shouldn't be V plus, it should be a little bit smaller because V plus was the first one that's it's gonna get, that's hard to go faster than it. Then this contradiction, uh, uh, this is a contradiction to the fact that V plus is bigger than V minus, and this finally gives us the law of flash numbers. Okay, so maybe this was a little bit convoluted. So if someone has some questions about this part, I, I will be happy to answer. So um, if not, let me just comment a little bit on how to move from this argument in the case of IID environments to the case of um, uh, the environments that are dependent, but now I, I assume the vertical decoupling, that these two boxes here decouple, decouple very well. Then uh, I have to update my recursive inequality. So before I only had this term PK square, but now I have to account for covariance of what is happening 
between these two boxes here. Okay, and uh, then this gives me this formula on the right here. And now, if I want to plug some type of tentative decay for pk, I need to put some quantity that it's in fact not going to be uh, much smaller compared to the uh, error term here, the covariance term here. So it, I, I cannot just take beta as large as I want as before. So I will have to, to take beta, for instance, here is smaller than alpha over two so that I have a meaningful upper bound in this pk plus one. Uh, so this hints why we want this alpha to be big in our decoupling inequality. So there we want alpha bigger than eight so that we can uh, have uh, pk is smaller than uh, four uh, to the k, lk to the minus four here. So beta is gonna be uh, around four. And uh, there are several other parts where we use to, we need to use some, uh, the fact that beta has to be a little bit bigger in order, for instance, to control the traps and uh, the environment of traps is gonna be dependent as well. So we need to control somehow in order to show that threatened points occur very often. Uh, one point here is that there is no hope to make exactly this vertical decoupling technique to work for conservative inequality, uh, conservative interacting particle system here, like the exclusion process, because then alpha is gonna be really, really slow, uh, small, like one half here. So this is not gonna be good for us. But towards the end of the talk, I will try to show, I don't know how much time I have, but I will try to at least hint how to deal with uh, the, exclusion process, for instance. So um, it's a good question to try to prove uh, law of large numbers just under uh, less strong mixing conditions. So one question that we can pose is that if only mixing is uh, enough, and this is not the case, so here we have an example I will not enter into details, but we have an example of um, environment that uh, cannot exhibit law of large numbers. It's just a continuum percolation of rectangles and they are tilted by some amount to the left and to the right. And uh, you have a drift on the rectangles depending on how they are oriented there. And um, in, in a certain scale, uh, the picture is going to be dominated by one single rectangle, it's then the, your fluctuations are going to be linear, and this breaks law of large numbers. So you can, you can construct examples like this. And, um, but uh, then somehow we need some estimate, estimating the rate of decay. The way we did it up to now is not good for uh, conservative particle systems. But anyway, we have a way out of this. So this is the next part of the talk. It's a, it's a joint work with uh, Daniel Kills. Oh, uh, and the, as Augusto mentioned before, uh, what I just did, is, it was joint with Ori and Blondel. Now uh, this part of the work was joined with um, Daniel Kills, and um, we consider as environment some conservative particle system, for instance, the simple symmetric exclusion process. So we are back to the case where our uh, environment is particle and the non particle. And uh, we assume that we, are, we start with the invariant measure. So we have IID Bernoulli with some density rho and jump pro jumping probabilities just as before, P bullet and P circle, depending on whether you are on top of a particle of, of a hole. And um, then I just want to uh, 
to picture here with this figure that uh, it, this environment does not present good vertical decoupling. So if you place boxes A and B on the top of each other like this, the covariance is going to decay very slow for our purpose. But if somehow you can guarantee that these boxes are somehow disaligned, then you can have a much better decay in the covariance. So here I just placed two boxes and uh, I assume that their distance is of order n, like their side. And uh, their vertical separation, it's very small if compared to n squared. So particles from the environment that are only diffusing cannot go from box A to box B or have very small probability of doing so, uh, this accounts for uh, a good decoupling for, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, for the exclusion process. So how we, we use this? Again, we define this deviation events that you go faster than uh, positive speed. Now it has to be positive so that you can guarantee that the boxes are not aligned or are not on the top of each other. Then uh, if you have several uh, box where you see of previous scale where you see this picture, two of them have to be not aligned. So you can use this lateral decoupling. And similar if you take speeds that are negative. So what you see, um, you can use the same techniques as we did before, but instead of having the first proposition as in the work with Orian and Augusto, um, we have a slightly different proposition. We have on the, the upper bound is actually much better because we have some kind of stretch exponential uh, upper bound for the covariance decay. But uh, the left side where V plus and V minus appear is worse because we, we can only guarantee the decay if V plus is positive or if V minus is negative. So we can only have good decay above V plus maximum zero and V minus minimum zero, okay? Uh, because we really need these boxes to be not aligned to each other. So if ever V plus is negative, then you're gonna get a zero in V plus maximum zero here. And uh, you're not showing that going faster than V plus is difficult. So anyway, it's possible to show sharpness. And why it's possible to show sharpness is just because when we look for these threatened points, we are anyway looking for uh, things that are not aligned, and lateral decoupling is going to work fine. So I don't have much time to explain sharpness here, but lateral decoupling will do it. And uh, once we have sharpness, I updated the inequalities um, uh, before. So here you don't see v plus and v minus, you only see v, they are equal. So this is our candidate for the speed of the walker. And um, this is not good for law of large numbers, but it is if v, v uh, rho is equal to zero. So if you have a special case where you can show that V rho is equal to zero, then you just pl plug here, you have zero on the top equation, zero on the bottom equation, and then going faster than zero is hard, going slower than zero is hard, then you have to go with speed zero, okay? Uh, so I'm running out of time, but um, this is the content of this theorem here with uh, Daniel and Augusto. So if we define rho minus and rho plus uh, to be these values here, this means that in between rho minus and rho plus, your V is equal to zero. So if this regime really exists, then uh, you have law of large numbers with zero uh, speed and one regime that you can show that this exists is 
Okay, assume that you are on a simple symmetric exclusion process with density equal to one half, and uh, the drift on particle is one minus the drift on, on holes. And then you are in a totally symmetric situation, and uh, then uh, you have Laplace numbers with zero speed. So this result was new, uh, it was not known before, and uh, uh, it's something that I consider uh, some um, interesting uh, uh, application of our methods. And um, maybe I, I can just take one couple of minutes just to show our last result, if, it, if it's okay. Uh, is it fine, Milton? Yeah, it's fine. It's just like uh, three minutes at most. So, um, so I will not have the time to discuss this here uh, with details, but uh, the idea is that now outside this zero speed regime, um, although we cannot prove let, let's say that we are above V plus. So we can prove that it's hard to go faster than this speed, uh, to, to go faster than uh, v, plus, uh, v plus of a whole Roma, Rho plus plus epsilon. But uh, it's hard to, we cannot show that it's, it's harder to go slower then instead what what we do is that we prove some type of ballisticity only so uh, we consider some density on this regime where v plus is positive because we are uh, strictly to the right of v plus plus of v plus it's v plus plus two epsilon then instead of looking at speed v rho plus plus two epsilon, we look at something smaller, but still in density rho, and show that the probability of going slower than this, that is a tilde here, uh, is hard. So this is a ballisticity result with um, positive speed. And in order to show this, we really have to play with the density when we move from scale to scale in order to blur the dependence of boxes that are on top of each other. So this technique is uh, more or less known by people in percolation, for instance, where we do sprinkling all the time. And uh, in the context of uh, exclusion process, it appeared in a paper of uh, Rangel Baldasso and sorry, I forgot Augusto, it's also a co-author of the paper. Uh, and and um, I think they studied detection for uh, by exclusion process in this paper. So I hope Augusto is not upset that I didn't mention his name here. And uh, so we need to play with these densities when we move from scale to scale in order to get something, some ballisticity. And this explains why we can only uh, deal with uh, densities strictly above rho plus or strictly below rho minus. And uh, our result is the following. Once we have ballisticity, we can plug into some refined regeneration structures developed by Francois Simenhaus and Francois Rouvenis and uh, prove that uh, we have law of large numbers by regeneration control the, um, the regeneration time, the tail of the regeneration times, and uh, show that actually the trajectory is decoupled into independent or more or less independent parts. And uh, then we have law flash numbers and it goes beyond. Uh, you can show conversions to brown emotion. So that's all I wanted to talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcelo. So are there any questions? Again, um, either in the chat or raising your hands in the participants window.
Okay, so Florian has a... Oh, right, Florian. Oh, I, I think I missed his so, question. Hey, um, Florian. Hey, thanks for the talk. And um, for the, you really rely on this monotonicity, right? So you yes. cannot, let's say, have jumps of size two or larger because then you yeah, could jump that's, over... That's, yeah. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I should have uh, uh, said more explicitly. Uh, so we, oh, we really rely on dimension one, and being on dimension one, and the nearest neighbor jumps, because it's, yeah, this part here, uh, in the definition of the threads, you really have to use some this idea of uh, if you see one of these threads, then either you're going to get delayed because you are going to pass on the left of it, or you have to run a lot to go around. So if you're in higher dimension, you could try to just uh, move a little bit in the other direction and uh, try to uh, avoid these guys. And also if you have jumps of, of uh, length two, uh, things break here. So in, in this sense, it's a little bit uh, restricted. We are working on that right now and um, we need new ideas, but uh, more or less we have some ideas of how to try to overcome these difficulties using ideas similar to that of uh, Kasten and Sidoravicius that, you know, you, you see the threats, the traps and you try to step on that. Maybe you're gonna need some ellipticity or things like that, but uh, uh, maybe it's possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So any other question? Milton, did you see anything else in the chat? I didn't see anything I in the chat. I'm not? If, uh, well, I don't know, question. maybe I can ask, ask some questions of of my own. Uh, let me remember. There was something that I want to. Oh, okay, yes. So there, there is something I, I, I want to mention that I uh, I found a little bit uh, uh, surprising about all this uh, renormalization the results. This is this sharpness stuff. Is that uh, you prove a lot of uh, detailed information about something that really does not exist. Yes, the fictitious regime. Yeah, so it's, it's like a, so, somehow a, a pity that uh, you have to prove uh, so much stuff about something that doesn't really exist. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a proof by contradiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's, as Augusto mentioned, it's uh, somehow common in, in probability uh, in uh, percolation as well. So we were heavily inspired by percolation, but um, you see, uh, we we want to go beyond perturbative regimes. So our definition of V plus and V minus is very implicit. They are good candidates for the speed. And uh, if there is a speed, then they, sh they have to be equal. But they are really, really implicit quantities. Uh, it's just the first value above which uh, it's hard to move and uh, the same thing to the other side. And uh, then, yeah, then we get this possibility of having this regime and we have to rule out it, rule it out. So it's somehow, a lot of work about something that doesn't exist. Yes. So I have another question that for, for, for you two guys. It's um, so the in the in the zero speed regime. Um, so we have this uh, conjecture that uh, the the CLT is not Brownian motion. Uh, the fluctuations are not. Uh, are actually given by the fractional Brownian motion. Uh, well, 
we have discussed with a lot of people and uh, everybody has their, their own ideas and um, for the moment we are the only the only examples we are able to prove a CLT in the zero speed regime at the end they all they always turn out to be a brownian motion uh, and, and heuristics predicts the fractional Brownian motion, and on those examples, the coefficient in front of the fractional Brownian motion is, happens to be zero. And so heuristics do, doesn't contradict that fact, but uh, uh, so some people think that there are, there are, there are, there are, there's, there's always Brownian motion, some other things that uh, there are more guys, not only the fractional Brownian motion and, 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 and a usual Brownian motion, so, what do you do? You have a uh, some um, some comments on on, on that. So uh, my my belief is that, like for instance, at least for the exclusion process here, uh, there should be only one point where the speed is zero. So this row plus and row minus should be the same, and uh, of course we don't know how to prove it and uh, so we don't know how to prove strict monotonicity for this quantity v row here it would be interesting if there is actually a extended regime with zero speed and uh, if it exists then i i i am tempted to believe that there should be some part of this interval where the their behavior is not diffusive but uh, our techniques are not really good for fluctuations so uh, the only result i showed by fluctuations was the last one in the positive speed regime only because we have regeneration so uh, here not even good bounds on the fluctuations we have maybe augusto wants to comment a little bit on that Actually, even in the physics literature, it's not consensus whether the zero speed should be diffusive or not. If you have, you know, the, in the conservative systems like the exclusion, you have a long memory along the vertical direction. So if your speed is zero, for example, in this symmetric case, in the second theorem there, so you are seeing the if you see a fluctuation on the number of particles you keep seeing them for a long time so the, it's not clear if this helps if this creates some type of traps so it's not clear if if it's diffusive there's some there's a nice paper by luca and someone else i forgot where they do simulations and get these several regimes and not the paper by the tozen where he gets some different results but it's even hard to do simulations there, so it would be nice to to have more large-scale simulations if someone is is good with that, because not even the physics community is um, in consensus of about whether there should be some uh, non-diffusive behavior in some parameter range. So, since that uh, there are no more questions, so okay, let me see if I can do this thing about. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do really do it. It's, it's just uh, below the participants' windows. So let's try it. So I'm going to unmute everybody now. Oh. Thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, oh, thank you very much uh, to both of the speakers. Um,